Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevan Davani. You know, in times of this where people, you know, have a short attention span, uh, just don't have much time to, you know, for reading stuff, books, articles. We have Geese One, you know, uh, one of the best uh, Bitcoin, you know, content deliverers uh, with a huge, you know, holistic knowledge uh, with its Bitcoin, Austin economics, uh, uh, you know, the essence of Bitcoin. And he reads uh, with his chocolate voice, you know, uh, from mo most of the most uh, prolific authors, whether it be articles or books or whatever, and comments them uh, in a really concise way. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm really excited to, uh, without further ado to have my talk with Gis One. Uh, give it a listen on Bitcoin. Uh, his Twitter handle is the Crypto Economic, uh, the Crypto Economy. That's how he started off. And um, and he's got his other um, uh, Twitter handle that is Bit Bitcoin Audible, right? So yeah, uh, without further ado, this is my talk, and we're gonna talk about. All kinds of stuff. Uh, it's going to be amazing, and uh, we're looking forward to that. Let me know your questions, and yeah. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, or uh, haven't followed me, I give it a follow, or subscribe, or retweet, reshare, whatever. Uh, that would help me uh, immensely. So yeah, have fun, and I'll see you soon again. Well, hello, hello. My special guest, or uh, actually, I'm I'm a special guest of Geese One, and <laughs> he's a special <laughs> guest of mine. So we're doing sort of a mutual uh, show here. Of, um, I'm the show. I'm the co-host of uh, not the co-host. I got them. What am I saying? I'm the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show, and also the Total Connector Show, which covers a range of topics. So, Guy, thank you so much for your time, and thanks so much for you know uh, for taking your time, and 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 uh, it's you know you're doing really God's work. I'm, I'm a huge fan of yours because <laughs> in thousands of years, or maybe no, maybe even decades of from from now on, kids are gonna go to some kind of digital, you know, hyper holographic uh, museum and say, you know, this is Guy who you know who brought in all this content and and educated people. So it's <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can't you can't appreciate that enough. So thanks so much again. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad we're doing a a joint episode here. I've been meaning to get you on the show, and like I, your Total Bitcoin podcast is the one that I particularly listen to. But um, uh, just you've put out some really awesome work with really awesome interviews in the past, and I am I assume everybody who listens to my show knows about you. But just in case, like it's it's good to have a chat. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Gee, I mean, um, there's so much to talk about, but I thought, um, as we discussed for, you know, before that, before, before we started, uh, I was thinking, because I've been thinking so much about how can we translate, how can we communicate this seemingly complex, uh, you know, uh, world or space around and within Bitcoin? Um, because, of course, it has so many facets, it has so many aspects from whatever, mathematics, cryptography, game theory, econo economics, even psychology, spirituality, mushrooms. <laughs> so <laughs> there's just so much, you know, but is it, uh, I mean, it depends all, you know, which, which, which dimension are we thinking? Which dimension do we want to like communicate, convey values, essence, the bigger picture? And I think there is a way, there's so many brilliant people out there uh, Bitcoiners or not, who 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 would have the you know the uh, the incredible talents, skills, imagination, uh, intelligence, uh, foresight, experience to translate, to communicate, to package all this stuff into a movie. <laughs> I was like, why isn't there still a movie like about the central banks? What about you know all the criminal centralized entities? Why? isn't there because how how else are we going to reach i don't want to mate i'm i mean i'm going to do this now again uh, officially i'm going to say this i told you already i'm becoming father uh, i'm we're getting a daughter at the end of december or maybe even on new, new year's eve to 2021 oh uh, congrats yeah, yeah, thanks so much and and you know and and now bitcoin has become more than ever the essence of my life because it's not about Bitcoin, actually, if you think about it thoroughly, it's about the this new civilization, this new freedom, this totally unimaginable space we could thrive within. You know, 
what is i want to know what are your thoughts what what have been what have you been like experiencing or uh, contemplating about how can we um you know advance our our knowledge our 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 empathetic you know technological uh economical uh, skills to to you know to communicate this this bigger picture and then go deeper into the rabbit holes yes so um w one of the things that i think like really positions bitcoin that it, it causes such a huge huge mental shift is that to own to like have your bitcoin is and to even understand why its value is almost a form of like radical personal responsibility and it's one that most people like we kind of live in the age of avoiding personal responsibility everywhere we possibly can just push it off to the next generation uh push it off onto somebody else it was somebody else's fault that this happened uh, my bedroom is dirty and miserable because this other person's bedroom is really nice and clean you know like like it's just it's just look externally and basically point the blame somewhere else we that's kind of like the mental framework that we've been under for a long time and because of it i think there's just this massive barrier to breaking out of that line of thinking but the internet has started to push that forward the, uh this kind of where i think the the um the birth of like long form audio has like really started to come into its own it's people really rethinking how they look at the world but there's a really cool point in uh the sovereign individual uh a book by um oh man i've forgotten the forgotten the author's yeah, names at, at the moment moss no yeah Mooks? i i never i know yeah i i i, I, I skimmed over it right. I, even, I even started <laughs> reading it but then it was i don't know i didn't have the time to finish it but mm -hmm. It's it's unbelievable, right? The the, yeah. the 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 projections and the foresight, yeah, the prescience and, you know, of the, yeah, what yeah. was happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but there's one really fascinating point that they make in there is that when when you're really changing kind of the mental framing of the world, when when you're when you're disrupting the old system or the old way of thinking, the other one, the old one, falls apart. The, the faith and the, um, the, the trust in the old system breaks down into chaos and confusion before we actually realize the value and find the new one. It's usually in the confusion and in the pressure and in the, the, the chaos of the shift, of the transition, that we finally find that new mode of thinking. And I actually think Bitcoin is really at the heart of that. So part of it, I think, is actually just a matter of time because I think by any, you know, decent, objectionable, like, uh, or objective, like, step back and look at it, I feel like the loss of faith in the old model is kind of apparent. Um, I mean, maybe some people would contest it, but I think if you step back and really just kind of look at it, it's happening. We're, we're watching that right now. Um, and so much of it, so much of it is so deeply tied to the state of finance and our money. Um, and, you know, the, finan the financial problems are a consequence of the money. So, uh, and it's not, that's not, that's not known. That's not widely known, but I think more and more people are suddenly asking those questions. What does it mean to be given $2,000 out of thin air? Like what, like why, why does that, why could that possibly work? People who I would never have thought would ask that question or even be interested in that topic are in fact asking that question now. Um, and uh, and Bitcoin exists in that world suddenly. Uh, and it's never been, it's kind of like, you know, it's the wild card in this where uh, suddenly the, just the whole, it's, it's a different game being played. Everybody thought we were playing soccer and everybody got good at soccer. And suddenly there's just a whole new game that a couple people are playing. Everybody's confused. They'll know what's going on and they're readjusting whether or not the game that we were all playing before makes any sense to begin with. Um, and uh, I, really, I think it's baby 
baby steps. It, it's just keep laying it because we kind of have the benefit. I, I don't know if you want to call it a benefit, like of the fact that we're in this kind of chaotic mode, um, that the old system is breaking down. I mean, yes, it's good that it's breaking down. No, it's terrible that it comes with a lot of pain and a lot of confusion. Um, but I guess that's inevitable. Um, but because of that, it's, it's like, just lay the seeds. And I think it's going to accelerate really, really fast. Um, particularly when it does kind of give this sense of, you know, and, and, and you know, maybe I'm just coming from my standpoint, I know you probably identify with this just because it's such an exciting and meaningful thing to us, but to compare that to kind of the state of like the normal person, I can't imagine it's anything but like a massive relief to think that, oh, there's this way of thinking that could actually make me excited about today. There's, there's this way of living and looking at the world that actually means that I have huge potential and opportunity rather than everything's just screwed 10 ways to sideways and there's no opportunity and two years from now we're all just going to die in a big ball of flame <laughs> um and and i think that's what a lot of people think i mean i have conversations with friends in the the old world this is really how i think of it I, I genuinely separate the worlds it's two different ideologies two different ways of seeing everything and it's just so depressing and hopeless when I go back to those other people. I mean, they think there's nothing left to invent. Like, I, I'm just like, oh my God. Yes, yes. Like I just talked to people. It's like, see, oh, you see can how learn far the thing. brainwashing goes. I mean, you know, really? you know, it's not only really? like value has been stolen from us from it for at least a hundred years. It's like so much technological innovation, ingenuity. I mean, just talking about Jeff Booth's, you know, book or, you know, listening to his, you know, to his, uh, to his talks. It's, 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 it's not unimaginable, you know, I mean, how, where do you think all these trillions have been siphoned off to in the, in the, at least in the last few decades, you know, yeah. why, why, why do people think, why do people, you know, finally find out, you know, also through the works of Cast, Catherine Austin Fitz. I mean, I, I'm a huge, you know, uh, fan of her, even though she doesn't understand Bitcoin, but you know, it's another chapter for itself. Um, so there is already, you know, a huge, Un, you know, a huge uh, field of technology, science, innovations out there, they're just waiting to be unleashed, you know, and, yeah. um, and I'm, uh, and, 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 uh, you know, if we already have like prototypes, and I talk with Jeff Booth about this, like, how, how do you, you know, how, how can we have like, uh, you know, sort of primitive prototypes of Boston Dynamics robots, they're just sort of as a front, you know, as a front show, but actually in the background, I mean, what do we know? What kind of technology are out there? Who, you know, if at the end of the day, these technologies are supposed to serve us, serve humanity. And, you know, so that what, I mean, what is Bitcoin about again, you know, so that we work less, that we have more quality of life, that people do exactly those tasks and, uh, you know, and express those passions that they're really, uh, really, you know, born into actually, but because of this whole, you know, compartmentalized indoctrinated system beginning in kindergarten, in school and universities, um, we've been all brainwashed and that's exactly what you've been saying, you know, just previously, you, you said people are somehow not able to question even, you know, the narrative, the reality, you know, but yeah. I, I, and, and, and to one more point of yours, you said something like, and I heard, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it for a lot of, from a lot of Bitcoiners and I'm, I'm, I'm the same, you know, I'm like, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, I think I would be totally depressed to, to be honest with you. I would be totally depressed <laughs> because why, why, why is it? Because we've understood, we've finally comprehended the root of all the symptoms we've really faced, we, were, we, we went really down the rabbit hole, rabbit hole of all the rabbit holes and saw whatever, the devil, the Satan into the eyes. And, and understood the, the, the consequences of all of this. And, yeah. and a lot of things, you know, that have been discussed in mainstream and anywhere and, you know, is, is actually, it's all symptoms. And this is the yeah. problem. We're talking about, people are, are, keep, are keep, you know, keep talking about symptoms. They're still going to the voting booths and voting the same shit, the same political party. It's like, you know, it's like Groundhog Day, you know? <laughs> it's like every day the same shit, you know? Why don't we just yeah. wake up, you know? 
and vote really with 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 a structural change you know with money yeah yeah uh, and what's uh, kind of the way I, I think of it is most people don't realize that money is kind of the root of our system like i mean money is is kind of the first piece it's it's right up there with or right back there with language as absolutely core to actually making a society function and i don't think people just don't realize how how far reaching and multifaceted the effects of minor changes at that level have on everything else and uh like, like i kind of see society as this like, like we're constantly like all the media all of the stuff that we share we're constantly looking at there's this huge giant tree that we're a part of and everybody notices that the leaves are withering you know and we're pointing out that like look this whole batch of leaves are kind of like dead and terrible a lot of these branches are really thin if the wind blows really hard we're going to lose a whole lot of like what we've already built here like we just see that you know the bark is thin on this part of the tree like we're just pointing out all of these after effects all of these symptoms like you say of so many of the problems and and these and we're rightfully recognizing that these are problems but we're failing to see that like oh well if there are any healthy leaves at all well we should take it from over there and put it over here and all the while our roots are poisoned and we're ignoring it the everything about how the tree is getting nutrients is corrupted and yeah. all of it is if we fix that we solve 90 percent of all of the other problems you know like start start at the most important thing you know if i've got a gunshot wound to my stomach and i've got kind of an infected splinter on my hand like yeah you know maybe talk about the splinter at some point but we should deal with the gunshot first <laughs> um and i feel like that's what we're doing everybody's screaming about splinters and uh you know hangnails and all these just dumb little things and we've been we've been shot multiple times <laughs> and everybody's ignoring it because it's uncomfortable yeah. and it's outside of what we're used to focusing on it's it's beyond um, schizophrenic i'm telling you it's beyond schizophrenic this whole <laughs> sometimes i'm really it's like beyond the, the movie even matrix because it's so insanely sick and so uh you know and so uh you know chaotic and 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 uh illogical that you know it's like the elephant is a room we just need to 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 accept it you know and to uh, enlighten ourselves we, we of course we need to begin with our, with our own you know mindset and behavioral and thought patterns you know and comprehension patterns sometimes maybe maybe people need to take mushrooms i seriously sometimes i'm, <laughs> I'm the opinion that people should take mushrooms not those that are prone or have the tendency to develop you know psychosis psychosis and all kinds of you know neurological psychological problems but i think uh because it's been so stigmatized and the scientific fraud has been going on for so many decades you know i think it it needs sometimes the this this for some people it just doesn't wouldn't help i think on, on the joe rogan <laughs> show i heard a guy expert yeah. say uh donald trump I, i'm you know i'm not a fan i'm not a friend of, of donald trump but i'm just saying maybe there's some people who who it wouldn't make sense to give him any kind of uh you know psilocybin or or lsd yeah. or, or ayahuasca dmt or something but i'm just yeah. it, it's uh, what i'm what i'm getting is it's like we need to 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 change our own perception you know and sometimes look look from the different angles and perspectives and and um and you know the solution is right there in front of us the elephant is a room and everything else as you said mm. is gonna just uh, be resolved by itself whether it be environmental problems inequality uh, sickness diseases we could even you know extend our lifespan it's all possible energy efficiency energy conversion transportation technologies um, this is this is just the tip of the iceberg what we're seeing with yeah. Elon Musk's Tesla this is just this is nothing we're still yeah. burning fuel and I'm telling you we can, we could we could already you know have have totally uh, different uh, technologies out there that would resolve everything even the environmental problems the contamination everything else yeah there's a there's a really interesting was it Danny Hillis or 
Frozen. Um, God, I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember who it was. Um, I'll see if I can't find the source of this, and I'll put it in the show notes when I uh, post this on my on my feed. Um, but there is there are a couple things that I've read in the past about kind of the progress of innovation and technology, and how if you go through periods like excuse me, um, like the Great Depression and uh, uh, like like really destitute periods during you know Civil War, World War II, like all these huge events in history where it seems like uh, we lost the ability to innovate or like markets were incredibly stagnant oh, and stuff. I that, think I know what you're talking about. Is that uh, the study also cited by uh, Safid and Amuz in his book, the, uh, the Bitcoin Standard on page 96, I think 98, where he where he cites, uh, maybe it's something similar. It says, Jonathan Hübner, a possible declining trend for worldwide innovation. And he, and Safed and Amus compares the 19th and 20th century, uh, zero to one sort of, you know, technological innovation, original or innovation, uh -huh. and everything else that after the gold, after the gold standard, sort of after the, the, the decoupling from the gold standard, it was all fucked up, you know? It was all like, you know, optimization, improvements, but not really like original, really ingenious uh, innovations. Yes. Now, what's now? Here's a really fascinating part of that, is that it's less about the fact that the innovations didn't happen, and more about the fact that the innovations don't progress on the market. Um, and, and that's what uh, what was actually seen during like the 30s is that you would think the Great Depression would slow down the capacity for new technology and it would slow down innovation, but the, the the reality is, is that it really didn't change very much, but we didn't have a healthy market to actually put it out and make it available to people. So what happened is that the bridge or, or the gap between those who could access the most important new innovations and those who couldn't and who were stuck in the old world just got bigger and bigger and bigger. But then after, after you get through that, there's an explosion where all those innovations finally spread out. And I actually think this is what we've seen today is we have a very stagnant economy because of the imbalances in money and finance have propped up investments in stuff that's out of date, stuff that's in unbelievably inefficient, stuff that's just burning through money. We have multi-billion dollar companies who have stock prices go up 10 to 20% a year who have never turned a profit, who have literally are consuming resources they're not producing productive value the whole point of pr producing a profit is to basically prove and know that what you are consuming you are you're producing more at the other end if every if everybody's running a deficit it just means that we're going to eat everything up and then run out of all of it that's what that means yeah and that's what we're doing we are propping up these zombies that aren't actually productive and covid the chaos that has resulted from that has actually started the push to spread information and to spread technology that has been here, that's been waiting for 20 years for people to actually utilize, and people just haven't gotten over the hump. They've just been like, I'll do it tomorrow. Like, we're, we're just kind of in this huge, constant state of like, I know we got to do it, but maybe next week you know, it's like, this still works right now and I'm still making money off of this. So let's just not worry about it. And because of that, we've never had that pressure to change, but this is such a great example because we've seen, I mean, what's, what's been the explosion in homeschooling? Well, look at the explosion of people yeah. finally going remote. Yeah. Yeah. It's of, become more important to me. And Daniel Prince is, I, I think, a, not only a huge advocate, but a huge expert because he's got his, you know, kids mm -hmm. of his own mm -hmm. and he, he does in podcasts on, on homeschooling. So this, this is going to become even more uh, important to me and my girlfriend since, you know, we're going to get our baby. And I think, you know, my, I, I'm not going to let anybody, you know, uh, brainwash our daughter. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to send her to school. Amen. Yes, you know, um, seriously, I mean, I was thinking even to emigrate, but, you know, it's just so difficult to emigrate to Paraguay. Because this is, now I understand why so many people emigrate even from Germany and other countries to Paraguay. I met them. I met some people, families in Paraguay, because they didn't want to send their schools, uh, their, their kids to school. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's, Yeah, that's you know, nuts. 
and it's, it's... Uh, and and you just you just see you know the other side and and uh, there's a documentary called Alphabet where you see sort of the the total diff you know the total opposite sides of ho homeschooled children and, and and children who are like totally compartmentalized and pressurized in you know in schools everywhere all around the globe and and you see these kids like homeschool like totally creative like you know intelligent and and with awesome skills it's amazing how children can evolve and prosper and flourish you know yeah yeah it's it's a totally different mindset um because you think about uh, like school i mean school uh, schooling could not be a better example of one of those things <laughs> that's just an absolute resource suck like it's a it's a black hole of useful productive things and destroys them uh, and and all you have to do is look at the price to even like realize it and compare it. The price of higher education since the year 2000 has tripled, has tripled. This is the age where you can learn anything you want on YouTube for free. Does it really cost three times the amount of man hours, three times the amount of buildings and books from 20 years ago? To, to actually educate somebody? No, no, absolutely not. It doesn't. I can learn anything I want on my own time at home for free, literally anything. It's a little harder if I take the free route, but if I spend 200 bucks, I, I can get a completely curated step-by-step -step entertaining version of it. And I can get one-on-one -on -one work with somebody like you can get that for such low cost it's unbelievable but we still send kids to a school that cost 15 16 17 thousand dollars a year so Jeez, that okay. yeah. they segment yeah they, so they, they can, they so they can stay at their parents home topics. you know and and you uh. know have a you know have a fucked up quality of life i mean what what kind yeah. of reality is this seriously and oh, let me before I forget this point. I wanted uh, you, you. It was pretty important. It was about um, uh, technological innovation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know Per Billund? I had him on my show too. He's an Austrian economist, also a scholar of entrepreneurship, Austrian economics. Per Billund. I'm not. Sure. Is he from Sweden? I'm not sure. Uh, one of those Scandinavian. Kind. And not sure. He, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll look that episode I'll look up. That, and, and it yeah. was so interesting. He said. Because I always said, you know, uh, um, this whole patent system is such an evil system because, it's, you know, yeah, you, it's you just lock in all these technological innovation. Of course, I mean, I understand that, you know, the entrepreneurs, uh, not the entrepreneurs, the inventors, these ingenious minds that somehow, you know, develop something, invent something. Of course, they want to be compensated. And either, you know, they get pressurized, you know, into selling their, you know, their intellectual ideas, sort of the intellectual properties and then lock it up. And then nothing happens, of course, you know, and I don't want to know how many thousands and maybe maybe tens of thousands uh, in technological innovations have to be just locked up in a closet. Yeah. You know? Or yeah. seized in the name of national security or whatever, you know, <laughs> maybe solar panel that have like 40 to 50 percent more efficiency. You know, it's it's it, that's it's just uh, just an example as a tip of the iceberg. But um, and he said something about the intellectual uh, properties, as he said, is actually a hindrance to technological innovation. That's what I was going to say. So, no, it definitely is. Um, so and I, I totally agree with that. Um, and one of the things, and you can actually see this with something like open source, is that the, the progress of innovations and iterations on open source, the, the focus is actually better. What's funny is that you get a lot of quote unquote innovation with the patent system, but what you get is arbitrary innovation. Yeah. What you get is innovation around manipulating the patent system, around making sure that I've got something that is out that solves the same problem a little bit differently and just differently enough that I can get a patent on it. But they're not worried. They're not thinking about solving the problem better. They're not thinking about foundational changes. They're thinking about how do I get something that can have a different patent on it so I can extend my monopoly on this solution. And uh, it, it's funny how much like people talk about, like, like I said, open source is just a great example of the exact opposite principle producing unbelievable results is that the engineers and the people actually solving the problems are solving their own problems. They're solving something that they know they need fixed and 
they are iterating with direct feedback from the people who are using it. And it starts, it starts from something that really gets at the heart of solving the problem and doing it as efficiently and with as little, it's kind of the worse is better, like Gwern, um, like, like concept of uh, uh, like, like Linux philosophy or whatever, like do it, don't solve every possible problem and make uh, an end product that's just the best product ever. Solve the most important problem as efficiently and as cleanly as you can and then build off from that. Solve half the problem perfectly and then start and, and then continue to iterate and let the actual community, let the people who are using the product give you feedback and tell you the direction to let it, to, to, to evolve it going forward. And that is that whole design system actually works because it's open source. It doesn't even work in a closed, like monopolistic, like walled garden sense around uh, patenting a design. Um, but it's it's actually focused right. Whereas again, the patent system gives the perception that oh my god, we've got. 3,000 new innovations this year, when really, the truth is, 2,999 of them are complete, completely pointless. Mm -hmm. They're just a way to make a new patent on something and not really change how we're solving the problem. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that like really gets me is the endless, that some of those, like, we're never rethinking the foundations. Never are we thinking about how do we redesign this from the bottom up to really, really solve these problems. Like everybody talks about like universal healthcare and that like, you know, the government should spend 43 bajillion trillion dollars to give everybody a personal doctor in their home to rub their feet. And not one of them would consider, well, why don't we just anything that's medically related, get rid of patents. You would cut the price of every one of those things by 95% in like four months. Right. Like the, the prices would just plummet across the board if you got rid of medical patents. If this thing is necessary to keeping sustaining life and keeping people alive, nobody should have a monopoly on that. Yeah. If you or, want to or, do or if you want to go into the other direction, like alternative health medicine, like like we yeah. want to talk about cannabis. Okay, I mean because it's just started a new podcast series. Uh, because my girlfriend has a grow shop, you know, for if she wants to really, she's an engineer from chemical background, and she's really expert in in growing uh, plants, uh, cannabis plants, and. And uh, so I've been doing, you know, a lot of interviews with, with doctors who are ethical, you know, who are really like committed to the Hippocratic oath, you know, like really want to help and heal p patients. And they're saying this is so fucked up and ridiculous. Why, why didn't you just, you know, uh, uh, legalize and regulate it correctly, ethically, rationally, because people are there more than two million, let in Austria, where I live, you know, there are more than two million pain patients. And, you know, we can just forget, you know, now we know why partially the essential reason why cannabis is still illegal, because you can't put a patent on a plant which has holistic properties, yeah. you know, of hundreds and hundreds of yeah. healing properties of cannabidiols or whatever, you know. So uh, it it's just, again, you talk about foundational structural changes, transformational changes. This is what we need. And this is why I think we're so, we have so much trust in the Bitcoin space. We have so much conviction and trust in the power and the potential and the essence in the real super, you know, spectrum of Bitcoin because it, it, it solves everything at the root level. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and painkillers are such a good example, <laughs> such a good example of the poison of the patent system is that we have simple, holistic, has worked for thousands of years sort of <laughs> options that nobody can patent. And instead we get a new painkiller every year and a new patent. Like it's the very definition of, we already got this problem really kind of sorted out and we don't need to waste another hundred billion dollars on solving this problem again and again. It's, it's like people just reinventing the wheel over and over again. Mine has a little bit more curvature over on these sides. Like it, it's, just, it's just reiterating the same thing rather than like building off of a foundation of something that's cheap, affordable, and open, but they can't make margins on it. They can't mar make, if they can't hold a monopoly on it, if they can't hold that patent, then their margins are half a percent, one percent, 
tops because they're open to all of this competition. Anybody can produce it. So the idea is, well, let's make a new thing with a new patent, uh, uh, you know, change it just enough that it's something unique. We'll ignore the fact that we've just added 10 really terrible side effects. And we'll just make sure we say that at like a million miles a minute at the end of the commercial with somebody smiling, walking through a meadow. And uh, then we get to sell it at a 80% markup because we have the patent and nobody else can do it. And and that's what we have. I, I like that's like kind of a microcosm of the whole economy right now. We're doing that everywhere, everywhere. And it's not obviously not just the patents. It's kind of the the makeup of how bad all of our allocation of resources are. And it's because we don't have real prices. It's because our money. There is no price is discovery. Meaningless. It's, it's 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 meaningless. I mean, come on. If that if that ain't like super central plant communism, just disguised as as what as whatever. I mean, capitalism. <laughs> there is no capital. There is no free market. If we had something like that, if we have real sound true money, like Bitcoin. It it, it it's gonna it's gonna force so much change. Um, that has been needing to happen for a long time. Jeff Booth, like you said in his uh, book, uh, Price of Tomorrow, uh, that's such a great example. Mm -hmm. Like he just talks about like, because technology is moving so quickly, uh, basically what we have done is we have tried to, it's like, you know, the ocean is coming in and we're trying to build up walls as quick as we can. Yeah, yeah. He compared it, it to gravity, you know, like yeah, central yeah. banks, governments are trying to fight gravity. You know? Yeah. They're trying, they're trying as hard as they can to swim against the current. We are fighting tooth and nail, and it's costing us everything to pretend that this massive force of deflation isn't here. And we have pushed in the absolute wrong direction and grown one of the most just monumental imbalances in the history of mankind for 40 years, 50 years. I mean, it's, it's, it's astronomical. It's extraordinary in the in just in the degree of like how great it is. Like, yes, it's terrible, but it's also just like holy shit. Like, look at what actually. It's it's kind of a feat. At the same time that it's a horrible feat, it's still amazing um, that such a huge imbalance and misallocation has happened during such a strong push in the opposite direction. But the further we go in the wrong direction, just the, the harder the fall, you know? Um, and that's what I think we're witnessing is that the deflationary push, uh, what Jeff Booth says in the thing is like, at some point we just have to, we have to let go. We have to realize that we can't fight this. Um, and uh, all we do is just completely obliterate our money in our effort to pretend this doesn't exist. Well, this is, this is feedback. Like, like, hard to comprehend how strong these feedback loops are. And even in the spite of our terrible money, you look at all of the things that have deflated at an, at a staggering pace, like information technology is eating everything. Everything is becoming a computer. Everything is now producing data. Um, and this is not going to slow down. This is speeding up now. Um, and now we're finding new ways to, uh, it used to be like kind of hardware and the digital world was kind of separate from the physical. And now we are getting to the point where we are teaching those, that hardware, we are teaching that software to look at and optimize the physical world for us. That we are getting it to see, it can read the traffic faster and better than we can. It can know the environment and adapt to it and and tell us what the best route for doing A, B, or C is in this environment or in this location. We're getting it to map the world for us so that we can make even better decisions. And that's going to accelerate on itself yet again. It's going to get worse. Yeah. Uh, well, quote unquote better in the fact that like meaningfully uh, better in productivity and value, but worse in the sense that deflation is going to get out of control. And it's going to be the, it's going to be the point where it, we will fight until everything just collapses, and all we can do is just fall into the water and let the current push us yeah. where we're going to go. But we could actually change. Bitcoin is a great example of just letting it ride, of being like, all right, well, let's 
let's rather than waiting until this whole thing collapses and we're you know in the water in the rubble while we're rushing in while the tide is rushing in how about we just how about we build a surfboard and we get up on top of it and we just ride this thing and have fun because <laughs> um, that's that's the key question how we're going to transition right yeah. how fast can we transition if it happens suddenly you know it's not going to be gradually for you know no. All of us, you know, all of a sudden it's not going to be gradually. It's suddenly. going to be so suddenly <laughs> and so unexpectedly. And uh, now let's talk about this, uh, um, Guy. I mean, uh, because I was going to ask you, like, what what, are, what do you see? What do you foresee as a like transitional phases? Like, uh, would it be the critical adoption rate of Bitcoin, the 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 hype inflation? I mean, if we just look look at the data, look at the numbers, look at the prices of gold, even silver, you know, which is like, you know, total elastic <laughs> production that, you you know, you could just, uh, it's like copper probably, but it doesn't matter, you know, but, but uh, the, 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 it's, it's like the quiet before the storm. Like, do you see um, all of a sudden maybe, you know, um, uh, hyperinflationary countries, uh, those that, um, you know, under sanctions or embargoes, uh, uh, adopt Bitcoin all of a sudden, and because of you know competitive uh, mining, uh, Bitcoin mining, and 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 uh, you know because of existential threat, uh, you know. I think it's going to be a little bit of everything. Um, like uh, we we like to kind of look at history as like key moments, and you know these like oh the gov this government adopted Bitcoin and that was you know what changed things, but. I actually think it's going to be kind of a infiltration of all of it all at once. Mm -hmm. And it's slowly going to start to eat 1% of, you know, governments having a reserve uh, because, because, you know, another domino of hyperinflationary currency falls. Um, and I think fiat is, fiat is in, is in exactly that state of kind of dominoes falling um, uh, is there are so many that are primed for a terrible uh a terrible move in the opposite direction out because of these debt imbalances because of these obligations that they the only option is to print money to to cover um basically they've made 100x the promises that anybody could ever even hope to afford um and in doing so uh those will start to push peer-to-peer -peer markets that's what we've seen with like things like Paxful and stuff. If you've, I'm not sure if you saw, I think Marty Bent um, posted it and I cannot, I still didn't look up his name. I've talked about him like a couple of times, but in uh, the Bitcoin magazine, Drinks in Quarantine, the guy who heads Paxful um, was talking about how the peer to peer market volume has exploded mm -hmm. in like 10 or 12 countries. <laughs> um, and that's one of those things where as soon as the people start to realize that they, they need to get exposed to Bitcoin and they need to start using Bitcoin, um, that's going to start to accelerate without a doubt. I think, uh, governments, particularly ones who are trying to shore up their currency or save their own ability to purchase things will start to buy Bitcoin and start to hold Bitcoin. I think we're already seeing them move into gold at an increasing rate, um, which is a recognition that hard money is absolutely a, nece a necessity to, to kind of the next stage of things. Um, I think uh, I'm not so certain that we'll see a collapse of fiat currencies at the scale that most people think. I think hyper Bitcoinization may actually happen as a consequence of trying to prevent the collapse of these mm -hmm. currencies. Because yeah. at the end of the day, governments will do what makes them survive. They are they are ultimately greedy and self centered, and um, they're going to if bitcoin is going to make their currency better they'll let it happen and i think that is something that's where the us all the nonsense aside um and all the corruption and unbelievable imbalances that we have aside the us citizenry like the country itself um the people in it not the political apparatus has more bitcoin than any other any other geographic location, any other like individual population. Um, and that's actually a good sign that the economy, like even if, you know, the government implodes or like 90% of what it does falls apart, um, that the economy could actually survive, that there's actually something to 
pull us out of the quicksand uh, when the the shit really hits the fan. Which maybe now I'm not sure. I still think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, but uh, I've been trying to. I've gone through my head and like done a lot of reading and investigating other countries because I'm kind of in that same situation. It's like, do I? Is it a good idea to be here? Because Ooh, there's some there's some really nasty looking potential for the future um but what's what's going to weather the storm the best because there is a storm coming and uh, so i've thought about like do we go through all that trouble of leaving the country do we at least leave that on the table like what's what's the short list of <laughs> of yeah, where we might go no, and seriously i mean look at look at the united states alone i mean the number of unemployment applications i think it rose to 50 million the number of insolvencies the people that mm -hmm. in the tens of millions who are not going to be able to pay their mortgages pay the rents people are, are a broke and, and, and what are you going to do with these people i mean if that ain't like the 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 fertile ground for for civil war i don't know what you know and that's that's just united states and let's not talk about even the european union where experts serious credible even austrian economists and experts over here you know who don't even have anything to do with bitcoin say the euro is going to crash by the end of the year with it's this year and and next year it doesn't matter anymore like uh it's going to be a war you know, yeah. I think it's going to be civil war, and and this is what I'm what I'm really concerned about. Like, uh, who is in control here? You know, of the military industrial complex, of the, um, you know, of all the centralized structures. Like, what's going to happen then? You know, are people are you know are going to be able to feed themselves, defend themselves? Uh, um, what about these people? You know, so yeah. that's I'd why I'd rather I be on the countryside. To be honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um... But that's that's actually one thing why, why one reason why I think um, uh, a kind of a framing for Bitcoin is that it is a tool for self defense mm -hmm. um, because I think that's going to be a a prime uh, I guess you could say meme that's stuck in people's heads is that how do I defend myself like how do I protect my family my wealth all of the things that are at stake now. Most people haven't had to deal with that. Like most people haven't had to ask that question before in the U.S. Um, and in much of the modern world, really. Uh, but they're going to have to. Um, and what's funny is that, like all of this stuff with the protests, with the police just abandoning things, with businesses just getting wiped out downtown, all across the country in major cities, just windows broken, buildings burned. Uh, I mean, Raleigh. The, downtown just out here was just obliterated um i think the conversation over i think we've had a stronger push for the second amendment as we've ever had yeah in this country like like anybody who says that like oh you shouldn't be able to have a gun to protect yourself because the police will protect you i think is is pissing into the wind like yeah. they're just they're at this point anybody with half a brain cell is going to be like yeah that's retarded like when you just you the because 90 percent of the people who say that are the same ones who say the police are abusive we should defund the police yeah and it's like oh so they're the ones that are going to protect us but 20 seconds ago you just told me they're the ones that you can't depend on exactly. that are evil that are nazis and yeah. we should not pay them anything <laughs> it's like okay like you know we, we kind of live in the age of contradiction here yeah States and the gun owners like... you know and that's a good thing i mean if you asked if you had asked me like uh, a couple of decades ago like what i think about weapons i, I had a totally different like position and, and you know and and uh, and, and th uh, line of thoughts and, and and you know and uh but now you know because i understand you know the the the, the total abuse the criminality of the you know whatever central bank structure nation states government mm -hmm. the, the police forces the militarized police especially these you know it's a bunch of thugs uh, and on the other hand, uh, you know, it's good that people, especially in the United States, are are actually outnumbering the people, you know, uh, the, outnumbering the police, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, holding guns and being able to defend themselves, you know, talking about the amendment. So uh, uh, second amendment. So, yeah, it's good. It's a good thing, you know, that and I think this it could be maybe the only viable solution to prevent uh the civil war or to you know not you know have it uh, uh break out in chaos because there's going to be an equilibrium 
Yeah, I think balkanization, um, the the breakdown into local communities and relying on each other, like leaning on each other and actually getting to know your neighbors and having the city, having the neighborhood manage this, that, or the other. I think that's the way out of this. And I think th there's actually the guy who was on uh, TFTC. I haven't listened to this book yet, but Strong Towns um, is basically My that Michael philosophy. Krieger? Michael Krieger? Is that his name? Liberty, yeah. The, Liberty Blitz, something like that. Blitz, Liberty Blitz. Or that sounds yeah. right. He's, that he's sounds great. Right. Yeah, I had him on my show. He's great. Yeah, he should, he should have him there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, but uh, uh, that's, I, I really think that's the, the kind of way that things are going. And what's funny is that that's one of those things that Bitcoin really, really promotes. Um, and it doesn't, it, it's obviously not like a, it's not an explicit promotion, but it's something that, uh, destroys the economies of scale of finance, mm -hmm. in a sense, of, of like that monetary system and pulls it all the way back to the individual. I just read a piece yesterday on the show um, about comparing Lightning as uh, against the current global payment system, like the retail payment system, and how Lightning could actually evolve. And what's funny is one of the things he alluded to was the idea of community-run lightning nodes that were like microservices where oh. everybody basically you have 30 40 people essentially open up their own bank and they help manage they have close relationships with each other so they know like you can actually build a a good high reputation trusted economy on top of this trustless money and that this these barriers to banking and licensing and all these things and the barriers to accessing fedwire which is you know maybe a thousand banks and you have to have a banking license you know the barrier there is multiple years tens of millions possibly hundreds of millions of dollars in resources and political connections that's the barrier to having yeah. a monetary settlement access. yeah we should we should give at this point like give a shout out to because i, I just listened to some uh presentational talks by uh like um Catherine Woods and um, mm -hmm. Caitlin Long. Uh, you yeah, tweeted about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. It's like if you connect those two talks, you see really you become so optimistic, so positive. It's like, wow. I mean, if that is the case, you know, especially in Wyoming, they've already, I mean, they're literally structurally, is, you know, considered they've already seceded from the United States because they've got their <laughs> own like super regulated, super like thought, you know, like, everything is thought through. And there you go, you know, as you said, you know, about this whole uh, lightning network and uh, localize uh, whatever uh, uh, economies or, uh, um, it's, uh, all, you know, there you go, you know, with this pseudo argument or counter argument against, you know, uh, oh, you know, Bitcoin is not going to make it with their throughput numbers and, you know, blockchain size and all this bullshit that's been been propagated all these all these years. Right. So there you go. Right. So you got a, a fully, uh, uh, especially I'm really excited when when Jack Mahler's strike is going to come out also in the European Union, because there, you know, then you have a really super user friendly um, uh, technology and application with with uh, I, I mean I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's really at least for to a certain degree oh yeah uh, it is uh, with full <laughs> yeah. privacy you know and anonymity for a lot of people so they can make microtransactions so all these things gonna come simultaneously I think yeah the privacy the privacy aspect like strike obviously does have KYC AML like that sort of thing mm -hmm. um because that's kind of inevitable with a company on this dealing in dollars um, but uh, it's a perfect example. First off, the user interface and the user experience is unbelievable. Have you tested it's, it's, it yourself? Have you tested it? Yes. Yeah, I've is been using cool? it for a while. Okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, uh, originally was only testing it actually by depositing by Lightning as soon as he opened that up because my bank, I couldn't connect it to my bank. PNC is garbage. Um, and in fact, I, I'm actually probably the first thing I do after this is I actually have escalated it finally. After talking to like four or five people, I've finally gotten it to someone who even knows what the hell an API is. Um, <laughs> to, to, uh, actual tech person at PNC. Um, and I, I need to call them back. So hopefully, fingers crossed, I might actually get that dealt with. Um, but I had to open up a whole new account at a whole different bank. 
um, just to use Strike. Uh, and I've been physically going to the bank, getting out cash and then depositing in the other ones so that I can use Strike because I just wanted to use it that bad. Um, but originally I was actually just depositing with Lightning. Um, and you know, if like Bitcoin spiked a little bit, I'd just deposit a little bit in case it actually dipped. Um, I, I was using it kind of like as a, uh, I could do like a little micro trade, you know, just, just to see, cause I'm holding it in dollars and strike, but I can pay any invoice anywhere. And that's kind of where the privacy side of it is. It strike doesn't know what they're paying for okay. on your behalf. Okay. So they're just using lightning and Bitcoin as the payment rails. And this is very much in line with the article that I was just talking about. Um, uh, it's written by uh, uh, Nicholas Berte and Chris Hunter from Galloway Money, which is new. They don't have like their products and stuff out yet. So they're still like small on Twitter, Galloway is, but I'm very, very curious what they're building after reading a number of their articles. Apparently they have built a alpha wallet of a non-custodial wallet and then a custodial one mm -hmm. just to kind of give the feel get the feel of working with and building both of those products on lightning and their assessment what they say in the article is basically even in its current state lightning can be lightning and bitcoin together has the capacity to build out and um uh, with liquidity or whatever to replace the current global financial payment system that Bitcoin is Bitcoin handles as much as Fedwire does actually, um, which is a, a tidbit that I love to mention to people is that it can actually settle as many um, explicit transactions as Fedwire does. And in fact, it's catching up. Like not only is it a very small margin, but Bitcoin is continuing to increase and with efficiency and stuff on chain, things like Taproot and the ability to hide signatures and do multi-sig and multiple input to output and uh, increase in batching and stuff. I think it will pass Fedwire um, and uh, uh, probably in kind of a major way. But with Lightning Network, Lightning is the perfect way to onboard new payment services and ones that can actually do so non-custodially, which is something that current payment infrastructure does not, has absolutely no capacity to do. You can't have a non-custodial dollar payment service. You know, you can't, Visa can't be non-custodial. This is the right. only way that it could possibly yeah. work. Not to mention um, reverse chargeback and all this bullshit. Oh know? yeah, 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 all that stuff. Um, and they literally say lightning can work now. And like, and it would be a massive improvement over our old, over the old system it says, but like pause that and then think about the fact that you've got an open source environment, thousands of developers working on this completely permissionless innovation. Somebody can build a groundbreaking app by themselves with no no banking license no asking for permission no needing like just basic grpc and the rest api tools that tens of millions of developers already know back like the back of their hands like just basic dirt simple stuff from a development perspective can create an app or a payment service that is an absolute game changer nice. and doesn't have any of the issues or uh, barriers to the walled gardens that we are used to, like PayPal, Venmo's, uh, Cash App, and that sort of thing. And that is, like, just that alone. Take out all the facts that you can, it's an HTLC, man. You can put any, you, you can put hundreds of different features and multi-sigs and, and, and uh, you know, potential for reversing the transaction for a day, you know, hold all HTLCs, key send, and you can build encrypted apps, uh, encrypted chat apps on top of it. Um, and that you could do micro payments for decentralized servers. All of the, all of the problems with like IPFS and actually maintaining a decentralized set of servers to store information are around the fact that finance is so closed off that you can't fund it. Mm -hmm. Now we have an open, uh, open source, completely barrier like low barrier payments uh micro payment system that can actually... handle literally like tens of millions transactions that's that's yes about it. within and now you like can fraction of a second like probably that. you know yeah yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's like the number of things that that will enable um and, and i think that's where kind of we're going is um that bitcoin is going to start to enable so many novel new things First, it will just start to become an infrastructure inversion. And then we will realize that there are these 
potential things to build on top of it that are stateless, that are global, that have no borders, and where somebody in the most despotic, uh, under the most despotic regime anywhere in the world can still just log into a service in North Carolina and have full access to a global banking infrastructure um, that, that they don't, it, it doesn't even matter if their government says no, they just log in with a VPN and they have it and they're, they have access to a global, like insanely low friction economy. Yeah, and on yes. top of that, if you just think the independence from the internet, like people like Alexa Alexander Cesare, Randy Brito of Locha Mesh, uh, or um, uh, who is it, Richard Myers of Global Mesh Network. I mean, mm -hmm. if we can bring like independence from the internet with whatever, like Blockstream Green, you know, Adam Beck and, and his satellite kit, if this becomes like super user friendly as a super small kit that you just plug in and you have super privacy and super independence from the internet, like in countries like whatever Iran or where, wherever, you know, I mean, this is the people who's going to benefit eventually, yeah. you know, and all you need this... is one bridge, right? Right. One bridge right. to the rest. This of is the really internet. exciting. This is the more, one of the most exciting because then finally we have a totally detached system, you know, from the conventional centralized, you know, criminal structures. <laughs> Let me just uh, go to the, um, we, uh, before, we want, I wanted, we wanted to talk to you about, um, the, the great wealth transfer, because there the came this report, I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, if, if it wasn't for the bright, you know, uh, uh, ethical individuals working in these institutions, such as Pierre Rochard at Kraken, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm still a, a fan of Kraken because of their, let's say, service and, uh, but, you know, but because of the shit coinery, they have a little bit lost, uh, you know, a lot of credibility for me, it doesn't matter. Um, and yeah. the title of this report, it's called Inheriting U.S. Dollars and Acquiring Bitcoins, How the Great Wealth Transfer Will Fuel the Great Bitcoin Adoption. And without going into too much detail, you can read it for yourself. Uh, we can maybe put the, put the link online. It says here, um, it's just the numbers are really interesting. Uh, it says here, by the same token, the data has yet to suggest that Bitcoin is doing anything but evolving, maturing and gaining global recognition. It is with the passing of more than $68 trillion in wealth over the next few decades that we expect Bitcoin to prosper from a multi-generational shift, meaning from baby boomers, boomers, whatever, to the mm -hmm. uh, millennials and Generation X. Uh, generation, multi-generational shift of wealth, beliefs, desires and expectations. And of course, this study, this report is pretty conservative, very, you know, focused on the United States, but still, uh, if you just, you know, uh, like zoom out, like, and, and consider the dynamic factors and the processes taking place if globally, then you can see the real potential for, for, for you know, the, ex for uh, the unexpected Bitcoin's mass adoption. All things considered, it says the idea of more than a trillion dollars, which is nothing, of wealth flowing into Bitcoin over the next 25 years is perhaps more conservative than outlandish and its, and its impact would undoubtedly be historic. So just going to, you know. Yes. You know. Yeah, well, I had a, a Pete, a Pete on the show to talk about that um, specifically because I, I think I mentioned this uh, prior to getting into this, um, was that that piece is really, really good. But it uh, it's it's data heavy, mm -hmm. so it reads in audio a little awkwardly. Um, it's just like one number after the other, and then there's like a big chart, and it's like I can't. It's hard to just be like, oh, the, all the things are going up on the chart. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> um. So, uh, but I had him on the show, and we talked all about it. But that was a that was a great piece. I kind of I kind of feel the same way about Kraken. It's like, it's the more. Uh, it's a shitcoin casino where they're at least doing productive work and they, they understand and look at Bitcoin properly, even though they're selling casino points. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, they have done some pretty amazing work as far as like their reports and stuff. Cause I'm always, I'm always digging in and reading any of that stuff that I can get my hands on. That one in particular is really good. And the key takeaway is how shockingly conservative that estimate is. Wow. Um, and that's what's most amazing about that is that they're talking about, okay, a trillion dollars is going to move into uh, Bitcoin over the next 25 years. But when you look at how they came up with that number, first, it's just the U.S. This is not the globe. This is 100% the U.S. Two, this is with the current investment makeup of Generation X and Millennials. Mm -hmm. So this is how they currently invest. 
and assuming that they will still only do, I can't remember what the percent was like 5% is in digital assets or something. Right, um, right, right. That, that's not going to increase to 6% or 7% over the next 20 years. That they're still going to be in stocks and bonds and housing um, at the same rate that they are. Uh, and then it's also that only that portion of the 68 trillion that's going, uh, moving from the boomer generation down uh, in inheritance is explicitly what moves into Bitcoin. And it's ignoring feedback loops, ignoring the fact that there's going to be an entirely new and separate economy, ignoring the fact that Bitcoiners are building crap like crazy and demand could absolutely skyrocket, ignoring the fact that if this money starts to move into it and you double the price, you get double the eyes suddenly looking at it going, why was I not in this? <laughs> um, and that the boomers themselves that are left over might start investing in it. Ignore everything about what might change and you still are looking at a trillion dollars moving into oh Bitcoin. my god that's really super conservative i mean just they haven't probably yeah, painfully i'm sure they haven't even considered the the the, the unexpected like capital escape like what, what are you going yep. to do with with whatever inflation hype inflation uh you know crash euro crash people are just going to flock to to bitcoin they're just gonna yeah. you know like moths you know <laughs> and that's light. what that's what pete says too is that like we we literally went out of our way to see what they kind of wanted to get a minimum you know mm -hmm. like like, what can we say confidently that no questions asked, like, take everything as static? What could we see move into Bitcoin? And that's kind of the most shocking part of it is just that you're looking at that much capital as kind of a, like, minimum, like, like lowest common denominator of what could occur. Um, and you know you're talking you're already talking about fifty thousand sixty thousand dollars of bitcoin with you know a trillion one point like two trillion dollar market on a hot stone yeah it's nothing yeah like yeah nothing. um yeah. so you just you just begin to real you you see so clearly like the overwhelming potential that this has to just suck up value because as soon as you start putting in the network effect and uh the the idea of the shelling point like Bitcoin is going to be the digital currency. Like 2017 was really the year that it came into everyone's consciousness um, and it became a household name. 2020 and 2021 will be the years that Bitcoin becomes something that you must have some of. It will go from, yeah, I heard about that Bitcoin thing to, yeah, I, I know I got to get some. I just don't quite know how yet. And can you help me? Like, like I, I really think that is this stage is that if you, I think at 2022, 2023, if you don't have some exposure of Bit, to Bitcoin, you're going to look like a fool. You're going to look yeah. like a dinosaur. Yeah, and that's it's what going you know, to Paul be... to the Jones, you know, and all these entrepreneurs, macro investors say, it's it's actually irresponsible not to have, you know, a certain piece of that cake. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's yeah. totally irresponsible. And not to, not to mention the, uh, you know, again, the halving and the whatever wants to think about the stock to flow ratio. This is all this discussion about plan Bs. But eventually it's about the network effect, the exponential network effect people coming in at an by order of magnitude into this into this uh you know uh scarce money and uh you know and by 2024 is that the next next halving who where's the stock flow going to be not to not to mention that the sharp ratio is going to be like off the off the charts and the yeah. the stock flow is going to be definitely beyond gold but somewhere between 80 or 100 or something yeah yeah, um, a stock to flow for gold, I think right now, the 60. price is going up, so it will, yeah, I think, I think it's still around 60, mm -hmm. um, but production will actually increase because of the increase in the price. Yeah. Um, and this is something that's, that's really common. You can actually see the, the stock to flow can actually go down because whenever gold is doing good, because it actually allows people to put more resources into mining it. And if you mine it a whole lot harder, you actually get more gold. If you mine Bitcoin harder, you don't get any more Bitcoin. Right. Um, this is what you gold just bugs Bitcoin don't get and Peter sound. Schiff doesn't get. It's relative <laughs> scars and we don't know, you know, yeah. how much how much gold there is out there, you know, or underneath the oceans or on the on the moon or on the you know, asteroids or anywhere, you know, or, or you know, you just need a new technological innovation where you can yeah. extract like if more much more efficiently uh, or maybe you can seriously with with sub nuclear technology, plasma technology, you could, you know, 
And he, these yeah, are that's the that's the thing that I always bring up is even even outside of the kind of more uh, outlandish scenarios of oh, we'll mine maybe we'll find some on the moon or we'll mine an asteroid or something, which I think is outlandish, yes, but um, still in the realm of possible. It, it's yeah, it's definitely. I think it's absolutely real, particularly when we have uh, a satellite or a machine that can go up and just do it for us. Mm-hmm. And like, we don't have to send people, you know, like, yeah, that's, that's not even close to really out of the question. It's just a matter of like, is it worth it to go do that? Uh, the cost. Um, and that's where like, if gold, first gold has already been through its monetization event, you know, like, like gold has been there for thousands and thousands of years. So it just doesn't have much upside in purchasing power. Right. It has upside in not losing purchasing power to fiat. Um, but the, the big thing is that if it's purchasing power specifically ever did go up, like let's say dollar value is static and then gold goes up to $20,000 an ounce. Um, what you're actually looking at is that suddenly it becomes, we do, we can do things like irradiate lead and mercury and turn it into gold. It just takes a ton of energy. It cost you know, with maybe, today's technology. Let's see. With you know, today's technology, we don't know technology. what's going to happen in ten or twenty years. You know what kind of technologies we're going to have. You know, exactly. Would it be, you know, like it's all about conversion of energy. You know, would it be mm-hmm. magnetical gravitational field strength or electromagnetic? You know, uh, subnuclear uh, conversion energy. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. This is this is what I'm saying. Like, who is in control? All this, you know, military, industrial, corporate complex. Where are the trillions being flowing into? You know. And which haven't been disclosed you know just, <laughs> yeah there's yeah. a lot of that too yeah um, and uh but if you look at gold i mean excuse me if you look at bitcoin uh one of the things i, I kind of love about the going to 2024 having is that the stock to flow um the actual production you know versus the stock of bitcoin will actually cross golds before the having because mm-hmm. You know, for that whole four-year period, there's a static increase. So we're increasing the amount of Bitcoin that exists, but we're not increasing the amount that we're producing. So we're actually really close to gold right now, but we're inching closer to it every time we produce a new block. Um, and we'll actually, in if gold's production doesn't increase or decrease, if it just kind of stays static, which I think we probably could expect it to increase, so maybe it's even sooner. Um, but we could see gold, you know, towards the end of 2023, uh, Bitcoin would surpass gold scarcity. Um, and after it surpasses it, it never goes back. Like there's, there, there's, there, there's no reversing of that. Like it's just, it's going to, not only will it go past it, but it will accelerate massively because we'll be right before a halving and then we'll double the stock to flow and we'll be doing it again and again. And it's it's gonna get crazy we don't really know it's kind of like that deflationary push that jeff booth talks about in his book is that we don't quite understand what it means to have something that scarce we've genuinely never had anything like that as a widely available permissionless market good um particularly with not the other elements of money like fungibility and divisibility and portability like all, all those other like massive benefits to it, just having something that scarce. And like that cannot only... ever, ever be diluted, manipulated and controlled because it's really yeah. literally not controlled by anyone, you know? Yeah. We just, it's, it's just crazy. about the access to the keys of, you know, but, but actually it's, it's somewhere out there in the, what do you want to call it? The ether in the space, you know, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it, you know, I think the cat is out of the bag. The Pandora's box been opened like for a long time and it's super decentralized. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been freed. The money has been freed. The only thing that's needed right now is a super like collective consciousness, like a critical <laughs> consciousness, you know, that, that just adopts it, you know, it starts adopting it. You know? and, and like I said, I think that will be a uh, gradually then suddenly thing. Like people will begin to realize that they'll lose faith in the old system and then they'll start looking for the new and that will steamroll really really hard Corey yeah. Clipston um from Swan Swan Bitcoin CEO mm-hmm. um uh has a great piece that I read on the show called the intransigent minority mm-hmm. read it, yeah. and yeah. 
we will reach that point where there is there are enough people who see the world through the Bitcoin lens that understand the problems through the Bitcoin lens and are avid promoters, avid believers in Bitcoin, that it will be this constant nagging presence in everyone who see, who still sees negativity, who still sees no hope, thinks that all the things have been invented, there's nothing left to discover. When I think we're literally the exact opposite, we've never had more tools at our hands to discover more things or invent more things ever in the history of the world. I see, not only do I see it as there's nothing left to discover, there's more to discover today than there has ever been ever accessible to us. I think exactly. it's the exact opposite is the truth, which right. just blows my mind that somebody could be so hopeless. Um, right. But, <laughs> And I think he termed a coin, uh, he, he coined the term uh, too, like critical mass or critical number. Like what mm -hmm. did, did he did he say a number or what, what do you think is the number like half a billion, 100 million people or two? He thinks it's 10 million, 10 million with with that, that, that uh, what is it? Is it 5% but, or? But I thought we're already like globally, we're already at like somewhere between 30 and 60 million people. Yes, he's meaning like 10 million in a single uh, in the US population. Oh, gosh. so this would be okay. specifically 10 million, very serious, very like mentally aligned Bitcoiners mm -hmm. um, globally. Uh, I wonder what that number is globally. But the thing is, is that as soon as it starts happening, as soon as you get the intransigent majority, intransigent minority, anywhere then it's going to explode in that culture and in that system and in that population right and then it's going to <clears throat> it's going to feed the growth of the intransigent minority in every other culture and country and population um so it's going to spread like uh, a massive bonfire that's throwing sparks everywhere and everything is dry leaves the, the fiat environment is dry leaves and and brush and you know, underbrush that's super thick. I mean, it, it's not, it, there's no better environment to start a massive forest fire. And that forest fire is right. Bitcoin fixing all of our crap. <laughs> yeah, it's just not repairing. It's really transforming the whole structural, you know, toxic soil that we have because mm -hmm. you cannot build a house on a toxic soil. You know, you have to, uh, actually, this is the way it is. You know, when you want to buy a, a, a build a house, you have to really analyze the earth, the ground. So this is what we're actually doing. You know, we are really unearthing all these rotten roots, right, with Bitcoin. Yeah, getting back to the beginning. Yep. Yeah. So um, Guy, uh, before we wrap up, some, uh, it, uh, um, there is this um, idea again, you know, which, which I'm so excited about. Like um, to, today I, I finished uh, listening to that talk with John Vallis and this filmmaker, uh, R. James something on, on Twitter, the hard money, the hard money movie. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, and yeah. I think he's pretty open minded, at least that's what he wrote. He said that would be great to collaborate. Uh, I said, wouldn't be awesome, you know, because uh, that's I, I pinned that tweet, you know, on my on my on my Twitter handle. I said, wouldn't it be great to like, really give people a, like much, much bigger picture. You know, not only does the causes, you know, the intercrisis, the connection, connecting the dots, but like zoom out and like what kind of world, you know, like ask people, all these macro investors, entrepreneurs, Bitcoiners, all the people inside this space, what kind of, of future do they envision? What is it that, what concretely, specifically do they see in the future? I mean, I have a very specific vision for myself, you know, yeah. how is this going to play out, yeah. like realistically on a scientific level, technological level, even spiritual level social level structural level you know uh, people and all, you know all this technology is going to help eventually you know people uh, uh, you know work less have more free time have more leisure time do more like creative productive stuff and you know yeah. evolve into prosperous civilization that I think that would be an awesome. Yeah, and I want your voice awesome to, be, to be honest to with you. Into. I want your voice as a background, your chocolate <laughs> voice as a background voice. That would be awesome, huh? Like a, a real movie, you know? Dude, I would love to do that. In fact, that's. I actually went to film school, um, no and yeah, yeah, I did film uh, for quite some time back in the day, and film was always my first love until, um, uh, until I I saw it less as saw it more of a short term or excuse me maybe a long term hobby and that it wasn't going to pay the bills and i moved into tech because tech was my second love um and but then i found bitcoin and like i've kind of gone full circle 
And now I feel like I need to get back into film, which I've always, I've always had in the back of my mind that I was going to make, I was going to make a movie at some point. Yeah. Um, it was just when I could make the investment myself and take my time with it and really do it the way I wanted to do it. I would just, when I, the thing that I hated about film and being out in LA was just that I was always doing somebody else's project. Yeah. Um, and it was never mine, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, but Bitcoin has just completely refocused and now I've found myself back. I didn't even quite realize that I was doing it, but I'm back in media and, you know, producing a podcast and like all this stuff. So we made a production company and that is actually one of the goals is to make a film, make a fantastic. potentially a documentary at some yeah. point. Um, and even more of one, something you mentioned earlier is a narrative, a, a story more than a documentary yeah. and it's a really hard thing to do because bitcoin isn't a character you, you know like like character drives story the story of an individual so you have to really figure out how to tell that story from a personal a, a story of a personal journey so it'll be really interesting to see what comes about but that's absolutely on the table um and i would love to see it happen whether it's somebody else or me or any I, I don't really care who it is um if somebody else is doing it i want to be involved uh <laughs> you know hit me up on twitter at the crypto economy what up um <laughs> uh but uh uh yeah yeah I, I think i think you're right and i think that's also one of those great ways to plant if you can tell a beautiful story you, you can, can make you people can, we see can touch things. people in the hearts you know that's what i'm yeah. saying if we can yeah. if we can just touch people in the hearts and souls and of course you know they, they need to comprehend the bigger picture it's not so like you know you go out of the you know the movie theater and you say you know a nice movie you know and life goes on but it's like something that's like so real you know uh, and yeah. so touching and so um you know transformational that it, it it changes your perspective you know yeah yeah um and uh I think I think Bitcoin is a huge candidate for that, and I think it's going to change the culture, and I think it's going to change art. Um, you know, very similar to how you know Safedine usually looks at the the negative perspective of it, of how art has been obliterated. Um, but you know, you flip the other side of that coin is how art will uh, change and evolve and become yeah. meaningful again, exactly. like like really deep. Um, and I think, as silly as it may sound to some people, um, I think Bitcoin is actually an incredibly important part of that. Um, and I think you could just see it just in the unbelievable passion of everybody you talk to in this space. Yeah. Like, like you, like, like we see this as something that changes the way you live and changes the way you think about the world. Yeah. Um, and that is not something that just comes along every day. Um, and yeah. so... And creative people and artists, you know, have such a huge, I think, social responsibility and power potential mm -hmm. to change a perception you know and 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 to inspire humanity uh, and a lot of thing a lot of people are not even aware of their power you know what they can do yeah. you know, this is what i'm saying yeah. you know we could literally like uh, accelerate this by order of magnitude this process you know yeah. why are we doing all these podcasts rookie i mean come on I mean, you know, <laughs> why are we you know writing so many so so much brilliant articles books podcasts videos whatever but it's still like mm, something is missing here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's definitely more work to be done. Yeah. Um, but I think the key piece is that since we're looking at the kind of an apathy of so many people in the world now and a loss of faith and a huge explosion in confusion and discourse um, or, or, or like dissonance, I guess you could say is to be the ones that are hopeful to to be the community and the people who are looking at the future as something that has unbelievable potential and possibility not something where the world's just going to freaking explode and everybody's going to set on fire and everybody's going to be stabbing each other because of the, their skin color and like all of this stuff we actually have solutions to these problems be the ones talking about the fact that things are going to get better and people will flock to you. Like, like I think what we need more than anything is, as uh, maybe silly or shallow as it may sound, is hope. Like yeah. people need to feel like the world can get better from this. Yeah. And it can, it can. 
Uh, in fact, we have all of the tools. We're just not using them. We're leaving them on the sidewalk as we run down the street, yelling and screaming about all of our other, all of our other problems. Um, and we just need to tell them, pick up the tool, and let's get to work. Because um, we can. Right. So again, um, to all my listeners, they should definitely listen to your, you know, chocolate voice, <laughs> and <laughs> to, all, to all the great, you know, uh, content you bring out and the readings you do. It's it's really amazing. Uh, uh, why don't you tell my listeners first? Uh, is it crypto economic and Bitcoin Audible? Is that are those two? Yes, uh, my tag is still the crypto economy on Twitter, but you can also find me at Bitcoin Audible, which is the new name of the show. Um, uh, but it will be the crypto economy network soon, um, just because I'm trying to create a, a, a group of curated content that will cover a lot of different topics around Bitcoin. Right. Um, and uh, uh, but you can find me up there. You could just search Guy Swan, just G U I S W A N N on Twitter, and I'll I'll pop up. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, check out either of those um, and listen to the show. I've got 421 reads. Today's will be 422. Uh, that list is ridiculous. If there is a piece that you thought you were going to listen to or you thought you were going to read at some point and you never got to it, check my feed. It might be there. And that's kind of the beauty of doing reads for most of it. I mean, I obviously have interview episodes like this um, where I talk to other people that about all kinds of stuff with Bitcoin. Um, and then I also do guys take episodes, which are just, just me. Um, uh, and I talk about some topic or go into uh, explore some activation thing or technical thing, you know, whatever it is, something that doesn't quite have a, a piece specifically about it that I can find. Um, but outside of that, some of these pieces are timeless. You know, sometimes I'm reading something from the 1970s. Um, I'm reading like a breakdown of Wei Dai's B Money, uh, Nick Zabo shelling out. That's never going to get old. Um, uh, Robert Breedlove just had Masters and Slaves of Money. Yeah. So yeah. good. So good. Um, Parker Lewis's entire Gradually Then Suddenly series. If you want a good image of like how crazy this can be and all of the elements going into Bitcoin, I think um, all the perspectives uh, about Bitcoin, um, I think it's three, 13, 14 pieces now in that series. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I've got the whole thing in audio. Uh, again, if there was something you thought you wanted to read and you weren't sure if you had time, check the feed on Bitcoin Audible. It may very well be there. If it's not, just shoot me a DM. Just shoot me a DM. I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, man. It's so, you know, it's so precious work that you're doing. Uh, so, okay, so hope we can, yeah, we can repeat this uh, sometime in the future. Maybe mm -hmm. as a threesome. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, no. Yeah, we yeah. got to really go deeper. And maybe, yeah, we could maybe even sit down with this guy who made the movie and at least, you know, brainstorm a little bit, like mm -hmm. what kind of direction we could take without, like, you know, overblowing ourselves, our capacities. But I think it's possible. And if we can achieve that, see, I mean, we can literally uh you know uh bring forth a, you know a, a visible transformation you know in people's yeah. perception and 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 action it's about human action when you want to use Boston <laughs> economies uh, terms um, <laughs> all right um, I mean, so, and you know i just i do want to say something just because um like i and particularly it, it's not so much today i have a hard time keeping up with all of it um but i, I think bitcoin content even if it's just another podcast that some people are doing, I know there's like a bunch of interview podcasts and there's a whole bunch of stuff, but having different perspectives and having access to um, uh, like different views and stuff is so critical to people coming in so that they can find that one person that they really like or they identify with. And I, yours has always been one that has been in my feed. That's that's why I reached out to you randomly. I was like, dude, how have we not done a show together? I need to get you on. We need to talk about yeah, this. We're both out of the um, box, I think, in some some, yeah. <laughs> some fields. <laughs> yeah, and um, you've had some great. In fact, what was the other one you mentioned just a little bit ago that I hadn't listened to? Uh, I, God, I usually write these down immediately. I didn't write it down. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to go through your feed. We'll talk about it later. We'll yeah, talk about it later. So we'll leave but, it. All right. Uh, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for both the shows. Um, uh, I've I've been a big listener, uh, off and on, pretty much for quite some time now. It's it's always in my feed, and and I love it. I love what you do too. So, thank hey, you. Thanks so much, bro. <laughs> love you. Yeah, man. Bye. Amen. Peace. Hey. So, what you guys think? Did you like it? Did you love it? 
I really enjoyed this. I really loved our talk. It was beyond my expectations. And uh, I think we should do this more often. Um, and, you know, always uh, it's always important to me to uh, not only listen to different perspectives and different depth and levels of knowledge and comprehension. And I uh, also wanted, you know, I was really curious about uh, Guy Swans, who's really uh, fascinating to hear about his perspectives, his vision, how he sees things, how he evaluates and, and, and uh, foresees things. So um, in connection, of course, with Bitcoin. Yeah, and um, I think we're going to do great projects. Uh, who knows, maybe we might end up doing a, you know, a, a glorious film, a movie, which has never been done before in human history. Uh, which can, yeah, uh, deeply change uh, fundamentally how we as individuals and society and civilization, as humanity, um, you know, uh, recognize our own abilities, our own uh, potential and prosper, thrive in a new civilization, uh, which is beyond, I think, beyond most people's imagination and comprehension level, even mine, probably. So, uh, yeah, it was really a blast. Uh, thank you so much for listening and let me know your feedback. My email is hello at the total .com. Make sure you follow me and Guy Swan on Twitter. And again, that is uh, the original primary um, uh, tweet handle of Guy is uh, the Crypt Economy. And, and listen to his um, awesome really fascinating audible uh, work which he delivers with his perfect voice on at bitcoin audible and his um, website is called thecryptoeconomy.com but you can find him definitely on twitter and yeah let me know your your questions your feedback we would really appreciate a positive review on any podcast platform if you haven't subscribed to my youtube channel do it now uh kevin davani or you can find me on total connector or total bitcoin uh, so thank you so much again for listening thank you so much for your support and keep stacking sets and it's time for evolution thank you